Hello, my friends, family, fellow Raptor heads. We have a lot to cover today, so I'm going to jump right into it. And I want to start with the Psalm of the Day. And this is Psalm 4. Today is the 1st of September, and Psalm 4 really jumped out. Recently, Dr. Barry Awe uh, recommended a channel by a man named Carl Lawley. And, uh, I went and checked it out, and he was teaching on uh, what is called the Neganath Psalms, and these are a series of seven psalms that he believes um, mirror the seven-year period of tribulation, beginning with uh, the first Neganath being the rapture, and then the, the subsequent years of the tribulation. Then there's more to it than that. I'm just simplifying it. You want to go check out his channels, you sure may do so. Carl, with a K, Carl Lawley. This is the first of the Neganoth, and it happens to be today's psalm. And this is where we're going to launch in today. We have a lot to talk about, so let's jump into it. Lord, help us as we study, always. Amen. We don't want to jump into error. Uh, we want to be clear and concise, Lord, so through your Spirit, we thank you for your help. So this is uh, verse 1. I guess it would help if I got you to the psalm here we are to the chief musician with stringed instruments and it's the word stringed instruments that is the word neganoth okay here we go hear me when i call O god of my righteousness you have relieved me in my distress have mercy on me and hear my prayer how long O you sons of men, will you turn my glory to shame? How long will you love worthlessness and seek falsehood? But know that the Lord has set apart himself, him who is godly. The Lord will hear him when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin. Oh, we love that verse, don't we? Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness. Let me put this up a little higher for you. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. You have put gladness in my heart more than in the season that their grain and wine increased. I will both lie down in peace and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Now, I love this because tucked in here are several different things. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I want to encourage you with it because it encouraged me greatly today as I read it, knowing it's a Neganoth and there are many things that are coming toward us, right? Be angry and, and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Although that's a tremendous principle. I think it hap happens to fit into where we are right now because of the injustices in the world that we see, the unrighteousness in the world. In fact, let's go a step further. The utter and complete evil that we see saturating the world today makes us, makes us, um, or can, let me just qualify it. If we're paying attention, it does something to our heart because we grieve for this world. We grieve for what is happening to the world, and, and there's a sense of anger. There's a sense of righteous indignation, but we are not to use that wrongly. We are not to use it wrongly, which would be sin. So be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness, pardon me, sacrifices of righteousness, and put your trust in in the Lord. So we're trusting in the Lord because he is our salvation. Is he not? He is our salvation. Everything that we're seeing in the world is pointing to judgment, but Jesus is our salvation. That to me is an incredible comfort. We live in a day where sin is rampant, and we know that there has been sin in our life, correct? We can look at that, and, and we can meditate on that sin, and suddenly we begin to feel the condemnation that comes from the enemy. 
But when we're in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus called according to his verse. We have Jesus Christ. Why? Because we have believed on him. And this is the gospel, that Jesus came to this world. The Son of the living God took on human flesh. You can read about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 to get a concise picture of it. But it's throughout the word that the Lord would send a deliverer. And that deliverer was his very son. He took on human flesh. He stood in the place of Adam before God, but the second Adam, pure, without sin, before God. And he stood in the place of God for mankind. He is the God-man, and he brought reconciliation. What is our part? Our part really is that we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We are saved by grace. That's that grace of reconciliation that the Lord has paid for us by going to the cross and dying for our sins. He paid for our sins. He was put in the ground showing us that our sins are removed if we will trust in the blood that was shed by Jesus Christ and the work of the cross. So he went to the cross, paid for the sins of all of us, was put in the ground, and then on the third day, the Father raised him from the dead. He defeated death. Death is defeated. The power of the law is defeated. The power of sin is defeated. The power of sin is the law, and the power of the law is death. The Lord defeated sin and death. If we will believe in him, by grace you are saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So if you're following the works of righteousness of the law, you are not saved. If you are if you're trusting in that for your salvation, you are not saved. But if you are trusting in the resurrected Jesus Christ who paid for your sins and the grace that he gave us, he extended his grace through that act and brought forgiveness of sin through the shedding of his blood. If you will believe on that, then you're saved. So that puts you into the place of being accounted as righteous. So we offer sacrifices of righteousness, and that is the praise of righteousness, the trust. We trust in the Lord. Look what this says. There are many who say, who will show us any good? I, I'm going to liken this because this is a Neganoth, and, and Brother Carl brought out some incredible things about this series of Psalms of the Neganoth. This is talking about what is happening leading up to, and I believe this, leading up to the rapture of the church. Okay, there's the buzzword. Naysayers, begin your comments now. <laughs> Leading up to the rapture of the church, they're saying, when is this going to happen? Who will show us any good? Who's going to show us any good? I, and I'm connecting this directly with the mockers and the scoffers of 2 Peter chapter 3. In the last days, scoffers, mockers and scoffers will come, and they're going to be saying, where, where is this coming that you've been talking about? For since the time of our fathers, everything has been going on just like it always has, and there's not been any coming. Yeah, the mockers and the scoffers are there. There's not going to be any rapture. There's not going to be any catching away. Y'all aren't going to escape. Y'all aren't going to escape this world. You're going to have to go through the tribulation period. You're going to have to die for your faith. You're going to have to show your faith. In fact, you're going to have to demonstrate your loyalty to God by dying for your faith. And unless you really have a lot of faith and you can make your way through the tribulation period and fight the Antichrist tooth and nail and win because you are covered in the armor of God. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I apologize. I just went into a rant and a raving, and I'm not supposed to do that. I'm supposed to lie on my bed. So pardon me. I'm going to go lie on my bed for a while and meditate. No, I'm not. I guess I'm mocking the mocking and scoffers, but what they're doing is fulfilling the scripture. They're fulfilling the scripture. So here they are. Show us any good. And here's the psalmist again in this Neganoth. Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. You have put gladness. Oh, I love this. Gladness in my heart more than in the season that their grain and wine increased. 
I will both lie down in peace. Here's your peace and security, guys. All right. We're going to talk about it in just a second because we're going to be going and looking at the Revelation 12 sign, revisiting that Revelation 12 sign from September of 2017. We're approaching rather rapidly the seventh anniversary of that sign. I believe it's a seven-year warning. I don't know exactly how it's going to play out, but I believe it's a warning. And it just so happens the UN is going to be doing one of their summits that has a huge impact on, at least in their minds, on the ordering of the world to bring about peace and security. So, But what's our peace and security? Here it is. I will both lie down in peace and sleep. We'll rest in peace, right? For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell securely or safely. There's our peace and safety. Our peace and safety is in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the only place you're ever going to find it, really. It's the only place. But there is everything that is other, right? The Antichrist is another, another, and other Christ. Just as is there, there is an other, another peace and security. That according to to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, when they are saying that peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them, and they shall not escape. So peace and security is the watchword. We have it, guys. We have it. So be happy and, uh, and rejoice in the Lord. Okay, what I want to do while I'm rambling, I'm going to I'm going to switch my scriptures over to Revelation chapter 12. I still get this question from time to time from folks, maybe who have just started following uh, different channels of of the Watchmen. Okay, those of us who are and have been for quite some time preaching the prophetic word of God and uh, end times prophecy. And they say, you guys keep talking about the Revelation 12 sign. Well, let's revisit it for just a second because we are coming up on the anniversary. It's based in Revelation chapter 12, of course, a parenthetical pause within the writing of the book of the Revelation by the Apostle John. And so it's like a a theater change. You're looking, he's he's watching the unfolding of uh, of the picture of what's going on in heaven. And then comes this pause. It's like he goes from, it's like he has multiple television screens in front of him. Just like in front of me, you can't see in front of me that I have several different frames that I will go to. So it's a different picture here, a different picture here, a different picture here. And Revelation 12 takes us back before, before what will be the rapture of the church. Okay? And, and the best we can connect to it here is everything that will happen after this when John is caught up. We're going to look at that and, and see what happened in September of 2017. And it starts right here in this parenthetical pause. Here we go. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. All right, this is what happened in 2017. And it started nine months earlier, all right, for 42 weeks. The planet Jupiter was in retrograde motion around what is in the constellation Virgo, was in the area of her womb. All right, retrograde motion is where Jupiter is in the orbit of the sun compared to where the Earth is in the orbit of the sun and the movement of the two because one is way out further in, in a... In a elliptical orbit, but it's so far out there as the Earth moves, and it moves, it it looks like it's kind of staying in place and going back and forth in one place. So it's an, an optics that is there. So 
John is seeing this. I saw a woman. He saw the woman clothed in the sun. So the sun is behind her, meaning if you are in Jerusalem when this took place, it was as the sun was setting, uh, you could not see Virgo. You could not see. So she was shrouded in the sun. And that's actually the proper terminology. Above her head were, were a, was a garland of 12 stars. And so, uh, just quick quick explanation. The constellation Leo, which is the lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, uh, is directly above the virgin, Virgo, which represents Israel, by the way. And uh, three planets, roving stars, if you want to call them, moved into Leo, and you had the principal nine stars of Leo, including Regulus, and then you had Mercury, Mars, and Venus. Now, there are a lot, there's a lot of ways you can look at this. We're not going to do that. I don't want to take the time to do it. So you had the sun clothing Virgo. The moon was at her feet. Now, this is September 23rd, 2024, and this is just a couple of observations that I'm going to make. Uh, my friend Repo Man brought this out very clearly, and, and I agree with it. The moon on September 23rd, which is the common day that we think of as the Revelation 12 sign, the moon was at her feet. It was not until the 24th that it was fully under her feet. Jupiter exited the womb. Now remember, Jupiter's still in retrograde motion. So quite technically, if you go back and look at it on Stellarium, Jupiter... Uh, seemed to exit the womb on the 23rd, it just kind of moved around, and on the 24th, it was fully out. So who's to say where Jupiter was on the 23rd or 24th? Uh, but we know that the moon was under her feet on the 24th of September, 2017. Now, what was I doing? I, I knew this was coming. My wife and I knew this was coming. We were in the uh, about three years, three and a half years into... Uh, two and a half years. We were two and a half years into um, our daughter's struggle with ALS. She was in a terminal illness. And, you know, we've had such great hopes, first of all, for her healing, and we trust the Lord for healing. We believe in healing. Uh, we are not hyper-faith people that believe everybody has to be healed because we know our redemption still is drawing near. This body is going to have its problems, and her body had a problem. We prayed for her healing. It didn't happen, at least in how we saw, how we wanted it to happen, because we didn't want her to suffer, and we didn't want to have to go through watching her suffer. Quite honestly, that was the last thing I wanted to do, that we wanted to do, was watch her suffer and suffer that grief along with her, which we ended up having to do. I don't say that to feel sorry, to get Sympathy, that's not the point. The point was September 23rd, pardon me, yes, September 23rd, 2017, the day that we actually thought this was going to be fully fulfilled, and the hour that it was supposed to happen, we were sitting on our couch in our living room holding hands together saying, come Lord Jesus, come and get us, just in case that was the moment in which the man-child was caught up. Now we know who the man-child is. The man-child is the church. All right, let's continue to read. It didn't happen then, and we went on with life, and we have gone on with life, sharing the Word of God, doing what we're supposed to do, and putting out the warning as often as I possibly can do it with as, be as much clarity as my feeble mind will allow, sharing the prophetic Word of God and how close we are to the actual occurrence of the catching away, the harpazo, the First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, caught up together with the dead in Christ in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Okay? We are alive and remain seven years after the fact. But let's go back to the scripture. So another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. His tail threw a third of the stars of heaven. Uh, pardon me, drew a third of the stars from heaven and threw them to the earth. Okay, I want to I go 
for just a moment and talk about those two words because you notice that the child has not been caught up yet. When these occurrences take place, the child is not caught up. If the rapture, and I fully believe it is, if the rapture is the man-child being caught up before the dragon can devour it, then what happens in the verse previous is prior to the rapture. See my logic? It is logical. you got to think about it. I want to show you some words. And... Um, and then we're going to put these words in perspective. Here we go. Revelation 12, 4 says his tail drew. Drew doesn't mean draw a circle. All right, drew. It's the Strong's word, sire, which is Strong 4951. It means to draw, to drag, to force, to sweep. Now we know later on in Revelation chapter 12 that the dragon and his angels will be expelled, thrown down from heaven. This is not that, because who does the drawing here? The dragon, his tail, drew a third of the stars and threw them. This is the Strong's word, Ebalin, which is 906 in Strong's. It means to throw down, to rush. In its most passive tense, it means to place, to toss, or to drop. So the action is of the dragon, whose tail, his power, his deceptive power, his long tail in the sky, draws a third of the stars. The stars not being the stars, uh, physical stars, but the stars of heaven, which throughout the Old Testament, the angels were known as the stars of heaven. And he sends his stars. The fallen angels, the fallen angels who have followed him. He drops them, drags them, draws them out of the sky, out of the place of, of where they are. Okay, out of the heavens, if you would say it this way. And he threw them to the earth. He drops them in place on the earth. He did that. Now, I, I cannot say this 100% with 100% certainty. But all of my observation, this is, this is moi, okay? This is moi. My observation is that if you want to see an example of that having taken place and having this drawing down and dropping into place the fallen angels on the earth to do damage in preparation for the coming tribulation and the coming time of Jacob's trouble, and to devour the man-child before it can be caught up. This happened, in my opinion, which means nothing. I know it has no weight with anything other than it's my opinion, but I'm going to state it anyway because I have that right. I have that right. That on October 7th, the day of Simchat Torah, last year, 2023, this took place, and Hamas did what they did in Israel, and the slaughter, and, and the resulting war, and the expanding war, and the world on the precipice of terrible things. And we're still on that precipice. We see it coming. Everybody sees it coming. Everyone sees it coming. Why hasn't it come? Talked about this last week. The restrainer is still here. The restrainer is still in place. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, talks about the restrainer. The restrainer is still here. The restraining influence of the Holy Spirit through the church of Jesus Christ. On this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. As long as we're here, there is no prevailing of hell, of hell, pardon me, of Hades, of the enemy, the power of hell, the power of of Hades, the power of death, the ruler, the serpent, the dragon, cannot do what he wants to do as long as the church is here because he can't prevail as long as we're here. But the restrainer will be removed. When the restrainer is removed, everything cuts loose. It is the darkest, deepest hole that can ever be dug for this world. It's going to be terrible for anyone to think 
that they're somehow going to survive this is utter lunacy. I'm, I'm not calling you a lunatic if you believe that. Well, maybe I just did. Please know I say that with love. That through Jesus Christ, if you will trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will be rescued. And I know there's debate on this, but if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and still believe you're going to get through the tribulation, then you're going to have a day of awakening the day you're caught up. And it might make you a little bit ashamed, but you're going to be caught up. I believe that. There are parts of me that do not want to believe it. And those are the those are the fleshly parts of, of Jimmy. The Lord is still Okay, enough of that. He's still still doing his thing in me, all right? So you, you have this restrainer being caught up. You have the tail dra- uh, dragging the stars and throwing them, dropping them in place on the earth. Now let's get back to the scripture and read the rest of this. This is uh, a continuation. Now we are in uh, verse... Do first for his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven, threw them in uh, to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Okay, the the purpose of that the the picture is that what comes forth from Israel, which First of all, was Jesus Christ, right? Jesus was Jewish as he walked on the earth. He was born of the Jews. He was born of the seed of Abraham. He was of the line of David. He fulfilled. He is the covenant king. He is the one. But he is also going to be the representative head. He is going to be the head of another body, all right? The the head of the body which it will include Jews and Gentiles in its entirety. That body will include Jew and Gentile. So there's no longer a distinction. So let's erase the distinction for just a second. That man-child which comes forth out of Israel is the body of Christ. The man-child will be caught up before the dragon can devour it. Once again, he cannot prevail against the church. Will he persecute the church? Yes. Have there been martyrs? Yes. Yes. Is much of the world of Christianity today under persecution? True Christian believers, true born-again believers, true believers in Jesus Christ, the saved, the church, the true congregation of believers throughout the world, the majority of them are suffering great persecution. Now, us crazy Americans are sitting over here saying, well, we all got to suffer the persecution. I'm right here in St. Joseph, Missouri, and I see it all over the place. I watch it. I'm seeing it happen as as, uh, churches in town are being sued because they spoke up against homosexuality. I see it within the school board where they have refused to remove books from the library, the public school library that we pay for. They refuse to remove books that are utter filth in those libraries and available to children in the entire public school system of St. Joseph, Missouri. It's here. So the persecution is here. It's here too. It may not be in the form of physical suffering yet. It may reach that point. I do not know. You don't have total persecution uh, in the form of martyrdom all over the world all at the same time, or there wouldn't be a church. Do you understand this? Please understand this. The, the dragon is poised. He thinks he can devour the church. He cannot. The church will be caught up. And that's our great hope. That's our blessed hope. This is the joy that we have in Christ Jesus. This is the gladness of heart that comes. And it's a greater gladness. Listen to this. Psalm 4 now. It's a greater gladness than they have in their harvest of wheat, grain, and new wine. So there's a time frame there. Uh, The the farmer wants that wheat in the barn, the time of the new wine. You've got to get to work and get those grapes out of the field, do the new wine offering. Yes, we've passed all of those things, 
but we're still in the harvest season of both the wheat and the wine. It's still it's still being prepared. It will be completed somewhere around the time of Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, all the way up to the time of the Feast of Sukkot, or Tabernacles. And the whole picture is by Tabernacles, it's all over and finished. The grain is in the barn. The wine is, is in the new wineskin. It's all there. Now let's celebrate. Let's be happy because we have a seven-day feast, no, nay, yay, an eight-day feast with Shemini Atzeret that pictures the entire time frame of the human race and the whole new day that's to come. So the gladness of heart for the, for the grain being in the barn and the wine being in the new wineskin is a great thing, but our joy is greater. Why? Because we see more than just the typology of the grain and the wine. We know it's about to happen. So there's a time frame there. The man-child cannot be devoured. It will be caught up. Time frame? Could it be in this end of summer time frame? I believe it certainly could be. I believe it could be somewhere in the next day, two days, three days, 10 days, 20 days, 30 days. If we go buy it, guess what? We are still close. I'm not setting a date. People are going to get their, how can I say this? It's going to get their earbuds in a twist by what I just said, because you're date setting. That's a sin in the Bible. If you can give me a scripture that says it's a sin in the Bible, like one commenter did, that's a sin in the Bible. It's a sin to set dates. <laughs> I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing with you, but you're not laughing. I'm sorry. Yes, I know I'm snarky. Lord, sanctify me, please, a little bit more. But you have all of this taking place, all right? Now, this was the Revelation 12 sign in 2017. Now we're approaching, we are approaching, pardon me, I skipped through some things there. We are approaching the seven-year anniversary of that. If you are to look at it from the Gregorian calendar, okay, the world calendar, the Gregorian calendar that is being used, then on September 23rd of 2024, we hit the seven-year anniversary. Yes, 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 bro, repo, I know the 24th was the day it actually happened, but everybody looked at it as the 23rd, so yes, I'm going to look at it as the 23rd too, not because it's correct. And some would say, well, that calendar isn't even correct. I agree. That calendar doesn't reflect properly the dates that the scripture gives. People are going to argue whether it's the Enoch calendar, whether it's the, um, uh, the, the, the Equinox calendar or the Day of Equal Parts calendar or the Torah calendar or it's the Hebrew calendar on the new moon. Yes, it's all going to be argued, but what I'm going to believe here, what I'm thinking is and seeing, if we're looking at October 7th as it happened as the day of Simchat Torah, in other words, the reading of the Torah, you are seeing that God is using the Gregorian calendar even if it's wrong according to his feast system. Do you understand that? Why? Because he's going to have, it's going to bring an awakening to the Jews. They're going to be ashamed. They're, they're going to be ashamed. They're going to see. They're going to see not only did they uh, wreck the calendars and how they're supposed to be following the calendars, they wrecked the feasts of the Lord. And the Lord said, I hate your feasts. Well, they're his feasts, but the way they're celebrating them, They've made them their feasts, and God hates those feasts. They also have not followed the Shemitahs. And uh, I've, I've been searching to find out if they really ever followed the Jubilees. And, and we know from the Scripture that the reasoning that God gives for the years of, uh, of captivity besides idol worship, besides following after other gods, it's because they did not obey the Shemitah years. If they didn't obey the Shemitah years, they didn't obey the Jubilee years. And so it's all caught up with them. It's catching up with them. And uh, the Lord is using the, 
the wrong calendar to bring about an awakening. That's what I'm going with. So September 23rd brings us to the seven-year end of that cycle. Okay. Now hang with me as I go someplace. On and Brother Tyler did uh, on Generation Two Four Three Four did a, uh, I don't know, bro, how many videos did you do mentioning this? I think probably three different videos. You certainly mentioned it. One you really dug into it, but on uh, September twenty second and twenty third of twenty twenty four. They have programmed the Summit of the Future. I'm going to show you some things about this, but we're coming up on the seventh anniversary on the Gregorian calendar on the 23rd of September. Now, if you if you want to if you want to see something very interesting, and I know I don't know if I know what it means or if it means anything at all, but I I not only see the 22nd and 23rd of September, I see 22, 23, and 24. <laughs> so however you want to look at it. And and do they ever get things done on the day that they say they're going to get them done? Do they sometimes delay? They sure do. But programmed on that day is the summit of the future. Now, in a nutshell, what is that all about? Well, the summit of the future is uh, has a roadmap, and that summit of the future is to consolidate and strengthen. This is the point amongst the nations, and they've been working on this for years, and especially the last year when they set several resolutions into place, particularly one resolution, which we don't have time to look at it, but it's Revolution 76-307 or slash 307, which basically reaffirm and strengthen and speed up the emplacement or the placement of all of the goals to make sure they actually happen by the year 2030. So it's the sustainable goals of Agenda 2030. Now they have the road to the summit of the future. And here it is, started in 2015 when they set the 2030 agenda. In the 2030 agenda, in a nutshell, is that by 2030, the world the world would be one. Uh, in their mind, the world would be one because they want it. A little play on words. See, yeah, yeah, that's clever. It's that the world would be governed by a unified one world government with one world currency, with peace and security for everyone and no one left behind and the salvation of the planet, not the people on the planet, but the salvation of the planet through having in place everything necessary for saving the planet. And so we have the whole climate change agenda that's involved in it. In it are 17 different goals. We'll get to those in just a second. But in uh, 2015, this happened. Then in 2020 came the UN 75 declaration. Not going to get into that. 21, they strengthened it, our common agenda. It's all pointing in the same direction. This was dealing with COVID, using COVID, using the World Health Organization's battle against the pen. Better not say it. Ick. I might I might get thrown here by using the word C O V D. Hope not. They use that for their own advantage. In fact, we know we know, there's enough. You know, you know, you, you know, you know it. Need I say more? And then last year, the SDG Summit, the Sustainable Goals Summit, and uh, in that they set about the one-year preparation for the summit of the future. And so that 2024, they're calling it not only the summit, but at the end or the last day of their summit, they will sign a pact. And many nations have already pledged to sign it. They will sign a pact. I find it very fascinating. The timing of it all is very fascinating because the world uh, is 
constantly talking about peace and security. So they're crying peace and security. Uh, the cry out of peace and safety and then sudden destruction that will come upon them may, may actually be a cry that says, we've achieved it. Okay, that may be the actual cry, a cry of joy. We have peace and safety because then sudden destruction will come and catch them all unawares. So I don't think it's the crying out for peace and safety, like, oh, please, we want peace and safety, because that seems to be throughout much of history, there comes the cry of peace and safety in the world. That cry was there at the end of World War II. It was there at the end of World War I, when various um, armistice agreements were put into place. It subjugated Germany for what they had done. There was no peace and security. It just led to World War II, but they were believing for they were trying for then the un was put into place so that there would be peace and safe security you understand peace and security has been the cry of the world all along so that cry that is coming i believe will be they think they have achieved it it may be through the covenant with the many of daniel nine twenty seven, or it may be it may be this september 23rd signing and if they're delayed by a day the 24th 22, 23, 24. The sustainable goals of that is the point. All right? I want you to see here the progression, and, and you can read this. Uh, maybe if I just gave you the site, that would be better. The site where you can find all of this information is very simple. It's unric.org so it's unric.org unric.org if you go there you'll see everything that you want to see about the uh, a coming summit how it was put into place uh what's coming what they're trying to do etc cetera, etc cetera. so they had the 17 sustainable goals and uh, that's what they want to complete all right Go check it out for yourself. I'm not going to read it all. It, it's fascinating that they think they can do it. I, I kind of wonder if it's the attempt to build the Tower of Babel. Uh, probably is. and That will certainly be the goal of the Antichrist. I want to bring this home for just a second because we have within our site the seven-year anniversary. If Listen to this. If the Lord is using the Gregorian calendar and, and the Hebrew calendar and, and the, the meshing of the two, which appears to be so from October 7, 2023, with Hamas' attack on Simchat Torah, the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. If he's using that, then we kind of see in that calendar you see, I'm trying not to spark debate on calendars. Okay, it seems like he's using that calendar. That places the Yom Teruah date, the Feast of Trumpets date, the start of the physical, pardon me, the physical civilian year. And by the way, even though the Lord moved that Rosh Hashanah, back to Nisan 1, or the first of Abib, okay, Abib 1. And he said to Moses, this will now be the head of the year. That's Rosh Hashanah. However, understand the dual nature of this in counting the atonement. The atonement pays for the Jubilee. And that's why the, the uh, Day of Atonement still is the start of the Jubilee year. So you can't discount the fact that there is a civilian year. And I've tried to do that. So I've been corrected. The Lord's corrected me. You, you can't separate the two, even though the Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, in following from Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, all the way up to Shavuot. Then we see the Pentecost of the new wine. We, we, we see the 50 of the oil. We see Yom Teruah in the fall. Understand that for us, this is this is the lineup. This is the lineup of redemption. And so that is the head of the year for us. It should give us everything as far as the joy 
of knowing that we are saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. And the whole picture is there. And it's there for Israel if they will simply see it. But atonement, the jubilee or the year of release, the Shemitah year of release, the jubilee year of redemption, where everything is restored, redemption takes place, starts with atonement. And atonement, atonement is the day that the sins are atoned for. In other words, it's a new start, the jubilee, the setting free of the captives, the restoration of the land, everything begins from atonement to atonement. I hope I made that clear. So we can't discount that, even though that Rosh Hashanah has been moved, the head of the year. This will be the head of the year for you, right? Nisan, the first day, 14 days later comes Passover. Yet atonement is still the count for beginning the Jubilee. And our atonement, our freedom from sin, yes, the Passover, but atonement also pictures it, that our sins were atoned for by Jesus Christ. Our jubilee is here. Our jubilee is here in the heart. Praise God. Hallelujah. Dance. (laughs) We're coming up on that part of the Hebrew calendar. If you go by, uh, where was I here? Okay, let's go back to this 22, 23, and 24. If you start counting at that 24 and go forward 10 days, what do you come to? Think, 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 think. Yeah, October October 4th. Now, you have to actually go through the 24th day, but if they delay at the 24th, and if you were to actually look at the actual Complete, I said actual twice there. That was kind of redundant. If you look at the completeness of the Revelation 12 sign of 2017, it was on the 24th. Now, the next day starts your 10 count, and you're all the way up to October 4th and the start in the evening of Yom Teruah. And the start of that evening is always with a new Revelation 12 sign, although not in the fullness of Jupiter in the womb and the 12 stars, the Virgo picture of the shrouded in the sun and the moon under her feet starts, and that's Yom Teruah. And did you notice it's a 10-day period of time? Am I, what am I saying by that? I don't know. I'm, I'm fascinated lately with 7, 3, and 10. The Lord tells... Uh, The church, was it Philadelphia? He says that they will suffer for 10 days. Maybe it's it's not Philadelphia, but I better go check. Hang on here. I'm going to grab my word so that I get this right. He says you will will suffer for 10 days, right? I'm getting to Revelation. Ah. Yeah, I'm glad I caught myself. It um, It's the church in Smyrna, which is the other church that received nothing but commendation. The Lord found nothing wrong with that. So pardon my brain freeze right there, but he tells them, I know your works, the tribulation and the poverty, but you are rich. This is Revelation chapter 2. I'm starting in verse 9. Uh, And I know the blasphemy blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of a synagogue of Satan. We could go off on that. We won't. Do not fear any of these things which you are about to suffer. And he's going to warn them. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and that you and you will have tribulation 10 days, not the tribulation. All right. we're, We're not promised anything that says we won't have trouble, trial, tribulation. But we will not go through God's wrath, and that is a seven-year period of time. It's the Lamb who opens the seals. 
It's the Lamb who sets it all into place. And throughout that seven years, and it is seven, it's given 1,260 days, 1,260 days. These are two sets of 360-day prophetic years. That's seven prophetic years. For those who say, where does it ever say seven years in the Bible? Read, my friend, read. You will be tested, and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now, what am I saying? There's a 10-day period of time between the end of that summit or the 2020, uh, 2017 Revelation 12 fulfillment on September 24th. 2017, there's 10 days to Yom Teruah of 2024. If we're still here after the 23rd, 24th, if we're still here, and I preface everything now by saying that, if we're still here, you know, if we're still here this fall, I'm going to do this. If we're still here in the spring, here's what I'm, I'm going to do. That's kind of like saying the Lord's willing. I don't think we're going to be here, but if we are, here's what I'm going to do. If we're still here after the 23rd and the 24th of September of 2024, I'm going to be watching for 10 days to see if there's an upswing, uptick in horrid persecution or heavy persecution on the body of Christ around the world, and maybe even right here in the U.S. of A. I don't know. I'm just watching. We're to keep our eyes open and watch. Why? Because we're heading up to. Yom Teruah. Now, I'm sure there's going to be some great videos that come out that are going to be fun to watch, exciting to watch, eye-opening uh, from, from our friends and fellow watchmen. They're going to be talking about this period of time and Yom Teruah all the way up through the uh, Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, and the end of Feast of Tabernacles. If the Lord tarries that long, I don't expect him to, but I'm not holding my breath either way. What am I doing? I'm simply looking up, and I'm continuing to work the work that I'm supposed to do. Right? I'm continuing to work in the harvest field. That's what we're called to do. The harvesters are, are few. Pray that the Lord of the harvest will send forth workers into the harvest field. And we need to continue to pray that for however long we have. I don't believe we have much time, but if we do... My eyes are on these things. They're watching these things because we are called to look up when we see all these things beginning to happen, Jesus said. Look up for your redemption is drawing near. And it is. So I say that using Psalm 4, uh, 4 uh, to encourage you to have the gladness of heart that is a greater gladness than those, even the Jews, who were looking toward the end of the harvest and the bottling of the new wine in the new wineskins that gives them gladness. Okay, it's a picture of them. Our gladness is greater. Why? Because our gladness is rooted and grounded in the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you should be encouraged. You should be encouraged. And if you don't believe that, let me say this. You should be encouraged. We can do this. We can do it. We can endure. We can carry on. We can continue to look up. We can be glad in Christ Jesus with the joy of our salvation. Praise his name. We can do this. Philippians 4.13. Yeah, you got it. Well done. I love you all. Stay true, stay strong, keep looking up.